Hello. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Nice to see you all. I'm Sally Swed, Director of Programs here at iBeam, a platform for artists to engage society's relationship with technology. I'm so pleased that you all could join us tonight here on Cook Street, as well as the, those of you tuning in remotely via the live stream for October's iBeam Assembly, which is a monthly program um, inviting artists and thinkers to take on the biggest issues facing the fields of art and tech, along with their broader implications on society. So, as attendees tonight, you have all entered into an internal use agreement with iBeam. Um, so thank you for going through the kind of paperwork process on your way in. And our host tonight, iBeam resident Drew Marota and writer Brendan C. Brine, will be granted special, um, and you will be granted special internal access to view image number, let me see if I get this right, 103-001-0000. EBC00. Uh, zero, zero. I think that was pretty close. <laughs> Maybe I missed a zero. Okay, cool. Um, in its original form, um, as well as abstracted and interpreted through painting and poetry by artist Sebastian Gladstone and poet Martin Mayfield. Marvin Mayfield, apologies. Um, so you should have all received your salary for the evening um, from iBeam's director, Roddy Schrock, uh, which we encourage you, I know many of you have, thank you, uh, to contribute to Lives in Transition, um, which is a New York City-based writing group made up of individuals who have been impacted by mass incarceration and the criminal justice system. So all donations tonight at the bar um, also go towards this cause, so we encourage you to be as generous as possible. Um, Great. We have a really full house tonight, which is very exciting and also a bit crowded and maybe a little bit hot. So if any of you need a little breathing room or would just prefer to be closer to the bar, uh, we are live streaming over in the gallery space across the hall. So you're welcome to kind of engage with the program uh, there as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic over to Dhruv, who will tell you more about his ongoing exploration of state secrets and corporate censorship in the gray areas ripe for artistic interpretation. So welcome, Dhruv. And Brendan, come on up. Yeah. Hello. I'm just going to put this back on here. So thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. There's a lot of things you can do with your Thursday evening. And looking at satellite imagery is, it's in, uh, it, we're honored that you chose to look at satellite imagery with us for this. So, um, My name is Dhruv. I'm a uh, resident at iBeam. Uh, my name's uh, Brendan, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much for iBeam for having us. Yeah, so I guess I'm going to, uh, well, first also thanks to Polyfill, who without this, without their grant, we actually couldn't have completed this work. So, um, and we will talk more about who they are at the end of this. So, um, I think to start, uh, I want to talk a bit about why we're here. So, in the last few years, we've collectively begun to understand and talked about the extent to which technology uh, companies control what we see, uh, when we see it, and, you know, I'm sorry, I, give me a second here. We've, we've begun to understand the way that technology comp companies control the way that we understand the world, uh, from, like, dictating what we see to how we see it. But uh, perhaps the most literal and dramatic example of this is with Google Earth. Um, by giving us unprecedented access to every square inch of our planet, uh, Google Earth has changed the way that we think about borders, geography, and distance. But in all of this access, it's sort of easy to forget that what we're seeing isn't so much uh, the planet Earth as it is Google's Earth. That's you know, a sanitized version of the world that Google, that the, the company allows us to see and that uh, they're allowed to show us. So I kind of wanted to frame the beginning of this event with uh, a question, which is, what can the ways in which Google Earth is incomplete tell us about how control exerts itself on these platforms? Uh, last year, Dhruv and I um, discovered an unprecedented gap in Google's Earth coverage. And when I say Dhruv and I, I mean Dhruv. Um, I was brought in to help later after Dhruv made the initial discovery. Um, through mapping when and where Google Earth satellite imagery updates occurred, we located a 100 square kilometer area of land in the continental US that had not received satellite imagery updates in eight years. Uh, this area is part of a restricted experimental weapons facility operated by the federal government, known as the Tanopa Test Range, 
we are absolutely certain that this is a coincidence. <laughs> There's no way this was deliberate, right? Um, so uh, what we're gonna see here uh, behind us is uh, um, a picture of uh, Google Earth taken from 2007 of the Tinopa test range. And, uh, and the next uh, picture is gonna be a picture of Google Earth of uh, Tinopa test range from 2016. And um, the gap exists between these two images. And uh, as you can see, they're pretty much the same. Um, is, sorry, yeah, this is the first image and this oh, is the second. still the yeah. first image, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 it's, the mouse was slow. Fine. Okay, cool. And we're on the second image? Yep. Cool, and this is the second image. So as you can see, they're pretty much the same. I couldn't even tell. Um, as curious people with a healthy distrust of uh, both governments and tech companies uh, that has sometimes been mistaken for paranoia, like that is making me paranoid, <laughs> sirens outside, um, we wanted to know why and how this happened. Uh, after more than a year of rabbit holes and banging our head against brick walls, we're finally here to share with you what we've learned. Yeah, and we also see this uh, event as like an exhibition opening for Sebastian Gladstone and Marvin Mayfield, who've created work that's both inspired by and a response to our project. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to have two experts, Sharon Weinberger and Mark Bradford, speak about the implications of our project, respectively on like the non-transparency of national security uh, in terms of artistic copyright. Uh, yeah, so let me just give you a sense of the trajectory of like what the night's gonna be. Uh, so first, Brendan and I are gonna give some background about the project, uh, and then I'll invite Sharon Weinberger up to the stage to talk to me, or to join me in a conversation about uh, this particular satellite imagery, um, military technology, and, and, and more. <laughs> uh, and then Brendan will talk to Mark Bradford and Sebastian Gladstone about contracts, copyright, and uh, sort of the, the process with which Sebastian went, went about making his work. Uh, and then finally, Marvin Mayfield will share original poetry that tries to kind of capture and represent this, this imagery uh, in ways that are perhaps were more important or true to uh, than the actual pixels that we leased. And then, yeah, right, finally, you know, there's gonna be an hour where you guys can drink and take a look at the work and, you know, look at the satellite imagery and, you know, ask us questions and stuff like that. So, I think a good way to begin is uh, to talk about how we discovered the gap. So, we basically mapped uh, all of the locations where Google Earth had updated its satellite imagery between tw uh, 2008 and 2016 and looked for gaps in that coverage. And, I mean, it kind of looks like this when you do it. It's not like a great graphic, but, you know, this is it. Uh, Google used to make access, uh, access to this type of information public but has since stopped. So luckily for us, there's a group of uh, Google Earth enthusiasts who archive some of this information, uh, and we're like deeply indebted to them, and that's uh, Timothy Whitehead and uh, John, uh, John Pike. Um, so yeah, thank you to them. So what you're essentially seeing is us layering information about annual imagery updates. Uh, and when you do this, what kind of uh, peeks through is this tiny little gap these three dried lake beds, which we actually now know are part of the Tonopa test range. Uh, Tonopa is a subsection of the Nellis Test and Training Range, which is jointly uh, operated by the Department of Energy and the Air Force. Uh, since the early 50s, the Nellis complex has been the site of extensive government aerospace and weapons testing. And this uh, next slide is a... Um, is a map of the test range uh, that is, was made by a, uh, an internet enthusiast, we'll call the individual. Um, so we're not entirely certain if it's 100% accurate, but it, we're pretty sure it is. Um, the Nellis complex currently contains the drone pilot headquarters known as Creech Air Force Base, um, the site of extensive nuclear detonations formerly known as the Nef Nevada Proving Grounds, and what is colloquially referred to as Area 51 which means no introduction. Uh, the F-117A Nighthawk Stealth Fighter, uh, experimental unpersonnel aerial vehicles. Did I just lose? Maybe. Did I? Oh, I'm nope. still on, okay, cool. Um, and most recently, the delivery vehicle of the B-6112, which is a steerable, steerable uh, variable yield nuclear bomb 
uh, have been tested there. Uh, Trevor Paglin writes in his book, Blank Spots on the Map, that Nellis is covered by a 12,000 square mile swath of military space, which basically means that Google can't um, use aerial photographs for it. They have to default to satellite imagery. Um, but an important thing to know is we don't actually know what is happening at Tonopah right now. And we don't know what happened between 2008 and 2016. Why we're not supposed to know is a question we can't answer. Right, but in, in a lot of ways, uh, what happened here isn't actually central to what we set out to find. What we wanted to know is how this happened, right? Like how, how, can control, how does control exert itself over Google Earth? Uh, so uh, not knowing much, right, we initially assumed that these images were censored by the federal government. Uh, and in an effort to understand this, we began to look at the history of commercial satellite imagery. So a super abbreviated version of this history is that in 1992, the Land Remote Sensing Policy Act made it legal for satellite imagery vendors to sell to civilians. So moreover, at the time, the DOD started investing heavily in these, com uh, these companies to ensure that American space imaging companies uh, outperformed any other nation. Essentially meaning that like, having the best imaging technology became a national se security prerogative. So, because of this cozy relationship, the DOD is explicitly allowed to censor satellite imagery uh, in a procedure known as shutter control. But according to the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, with whom uh, Brendan and I contacted, uh, shutter control has never been invoked. And that's probably because of the amount of paperwork uh, and bureaucracy necessary to actually do this. But a more sneaky method of censorship uh, is uh, something called buy to deny. Uh, and this is something that uh, has been reported over, but uh, reported about. But this occurs when agencies purchase the exclusive rights to satellite imagery uh, and then essentially sit on them, uh, making them effect or like effectively removing them from the commercial satellite imagery market. Uh, that, and that's where Google acquires map tiles. Uh, to find out if either one of these methods, shutter control or buy to deny, were used on uh, Tonopa, we emailed uh, this guy named Brock at uh, Apollo Mapping. He's a very nice gentleman. Um, Apollo resells commercial satellite imagery and works closely with uh, Digital Globe, which is the industry leader in commercial satellite uh, imagery vending. Digital Globe sells directly to Google, uh, Earth, which stitches together the satellite images uh, with aerial photographs to make Google Earth. Um, Brock showed us much to our surprise at least eight images from that time period, which would have fulfilled what we considered uh, Google Earth's apparent needs, being color, uh, decent coverage, high resolution, and no cloud cover. Since uh, apparently the federal government took no steps to keep Apollo from selling these images to us, we more or less decided that the censorship must be an internal Google decision. Google did not, and I know you will all be shocked to hear this, respond to our various queries. <laughs> um, until yesterday, when we published uh, an essay in Motherboard, and uh, they finally got back to us the day after with um, this. Uh, Google Earth didn't censor this area in Nevada. Our satellite imagery is licensed from third-party providers, which are commercially available and are not the property of Google. We update imagery by prioritizing areas that are most popular with users while complying with local and federal laws, which like means nothing, basically. Right. <laughs> um, so we decided uh, a while ago, um, much before we got this email, to buy exclusive rights to one of these images from Apollo, sort of like the government buys exclusive rights from Digital Globe, and uh, sell that image to Google for a dollar to help them out with their historical data set. Right, and uh, so with, an aforementioned, with the aforementioned grant from Polyfill Foundation, we were actually able to acquire one of these images. Uh, so the image that we're gonna show you uh, was taken in 2013 for the academic price of $1,984.50. Uh, you know, but upon looking at that contract that we signed, we kind of, we found out that this was you know, a one-year lease of the photo and it specifically stated that the image was solely for customers' internal use and that we weren't, we're not, quote, uh, to distribute, sublicense, rent, 
sell, lease, or loan the products or imagery derivatives to any third party. And I think a conversation we'll have later is like, what exactly is an image, imagery derivative? But um, this is the reason why all of you had to sign a contract at the door, uh, making you authorized users, so you could finally, after all of this, take a look at the imagery that we're going to show you. So what you're about to see is uh, an image, as Sally pointed out, entitled image number 103001-000EBC3C00. Uh, and it was taken uh, July 1st in 2013 by a satellite called Worldview 2, which is owned and operated by Digital Globe. So I've uh, essentially cropped smaller, more high resolution ver uh, pieces of the image because it's uh, together stitched on the, on the screen. It's really not legible as anything. Ta-da. <laughs> that might be the last slide. But you know, there's There'll, there'll be an opportunity at the end of the event to look more closely at this imagery. Uh, I'm going to zoom back because I can't get out of this. But while I'd figure this out, oh, there we go, great. Um, so I think, yeah, what's up? Cool, so I think like, uh, at this point, I'm gonna call Sharon and tell her to come up to the stage. And uh, while she does that, let me tell you a bit about who Sharon is. So. Sharon Weinberger is the DC Bureau Chief of Yahoo News. Previously, she was an, the Executive Director at Foreign Policy Magazine, and before that, the National Security Editor at The Intercept. Sharon writes about the intersection between military science and technology, and recently wrote a comprehensive history of DARPA called The Imagineers of War, which I suggest all of you read. It's very, it's very good. Uh, so I reached out to Sharon because I'm a fan of her work, and I'm honored that she's interested in this project and here to share some of her expertise. So if you could join me in welcoming Sharon. Thank you. All right. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me here. <laughs> so um, I think a good way to start is uh, with some of our earlier conversations. So when I mentioned the lapse in Google's data set to you, sort of immediately guessed that the site in question was the Tonopah test range. Yeah, if I recall when you emailed me a number of months back, you sort of mentioned the project but didn't mention the site. And I, I have to admit it wasn't that I had this great insight into it, but I made an educated guess of what site it was, and in part, because when you talked about it, I knew that you know Area 51 that most of us are familiar with, there actually is quite a bit of imagery in it, and quite periodically there are organizations and even news organizations that will post updated imagery. So I didn't think that was the issue. Um, in my reporting, I had remembered a number of years back some sources mentioning to me I was doing some work for my book on DARPA about the history of, um, of stealth drones and of classified development. And um, one source had told me, well, that place you should really look at is Tonopa because there had been a lot of classified testing there that hasn't been widely reported up. People tend to focus on Area 51. So it was a good guess, um, but apparently the right one. Right, right. And I feel like, so does the fact that this omission occurred at Tonopa rather than Aberdeen or Area 51 tell you anything about the nature of the technology that was being tested and being used there? Well, absolutely. I mean, what is a parallel there with Area 51 is this is, those do tend to be sites um, of where new black programs, so let's, let's sort of differentiate for a second between classified programs, programs that we know exist even if certain elements of their development are secret or top secret. Um, and a black program, meaning a, a tech, you know, it can be any sort of program, but in this case, let's say a technology program whose existence is not even acknowledged. Um, so as an example, the early stealth aircraft in development were not the, pro the programs, there were code names, and they weren't even acknowledged to have existed to the public until they were declassified or leaked in some cases. Um, and so this is certainly a range where those things have gone on. Right, so like knowing you know, that they test experimental aircraft, 
and you know, seeing the imagery, because I'd sent the imagery to Sharon. Uh, do you, you know, feel free to speculate wildly, but did you see anything that the casual observer might not have seen like when you know, Brendan and I were looking at this as you know, sort of satellite imagery dilettantes? You know, I wish I could say that I'm one of those people who can look at satellite imagery and, you know, instantly say, yes, that could be this. I am not. There are people a lot more technically adept to me. So what I did do was I, um, I contacted a nuclear physicist who'd worked for government for a number of years and had often been consulted on, particularly during the Cold War, to analyze um, satellite imagery of Soviet and then later Russian test sites and had been rather famous for identifying correctly some of these classified sites. So I, I met with him for coffee and showed him, am I allowed to admit that I showed him some of the imagery? Anyway. He was an, inter um, he was an internal user. He was an internal user, yes. And you know, his first comment to me was, that's pretty freaking weird. Um, you know, so what he was able to do that I couldn't, um, you don't have the imagery up, was to hone in on certain parts of the image and actually talk, I mean, even he couldn't say like, yes, that's a classified stealth drone testing facility. But he, what he could mark was like, okay, here's a road lead in and here's what looks like a control site, you know, a barrier for controlled access to the site. He also commented on some specific features. For instance, you know, I looked at the image um, that, that you all have seen and you see some circles. He blew up the image and said those aren't circles. Um, if you actually blow them up, you see um, actually angled edges, which he began to speculate. And he, he did admit, he said, look, this is speculation that this is for radar cross-section testing, um, which is used, again, for, for, it can be used for stealth aircraft. Right. And I feel like, so, I keep saying that, but uh, do you have a sense of like how the mission might have occurred? Because so much of this is uh, speculation. We we can't really prove too much with what we have. But um, yeah, any any sense of was this a, a request from the federal government to Google or a Google internal decision or? You know. Oh, on that I can I can certainly make more educated speculation on that than I can on what they were actually doing there. I mean, I think as you mentioned in your opening remarks, one of the really the fascination with this project isn't you know what technology they developed there. We, we can speculate, but we don't know. It probably is very interesting. But what we do know is that, no, it absolutely wasn't a coincidence that there's a years-long period that there weren't updates. What we do know is that there has, over the past 10 years, been a very sort of, I don't know what to call it, a, a, a non-transparent relationship between Google and the US government on withholding information. So you talked about things like shutter control, buying up imagery. Um, those are things that are acknowledged but actually have been used very rarely. I think the buying up of imagery was only exercised during the first Gulf War. And um, I think there's some speculation that it happened in 2003 with uh, Afghanistan. Yes, yeah. I think that's even more, yeah, I think you're right on that. But it's, it's, it's very rare. And then shutter control itself has never been exercised. According to the NGIA, right. yeah. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, that you know, when some of these things were put in place, it was before there were other countries that had equivalent satellite systems. So in, in some cases, this hasn't been exercised, not out of you know, the goodness of the government, just because it wouldn't do any good. You could get the imagery from foreign sources. Um, but th this is what we do know, that there have been cases in the past, you know, when I last looked at this from a reporting perspective, I think some 10 years ago, um, one of the more famous cases was when Dick Cheney was vice president, the Naval Observatory, which was the vi is the vice president's residence, for a while um, was basically sort of shaded out in Google Earth. And Google Earth gave very sort of odd answers about why. They're like, we, we, we don't take the imagery, we buy it, we take it from the US, what is it, the Geological Service. Um, so, you know, we have no control, but it, it was clear that it had been, it wasn't random. This was also around the time where I think it was uh, rumored that they were building basically a bunker at the vice president. I mean, there were a lot of things going on in DC post 9-11. Um, but it was what was very strange to me at the time was why not just say that the federal government asked us not to use certain imagery? Um, and I actually think, and we talked about this the other day, censorship isn't even quite the right word because, I mean, censorship implies that there's, you know, someone makes a decision to censor. It is sort of self-withholding that the government makes the request and then Google, for whatever its reasons, it appears to be that it um, complies with this request. And in some ways, I, I, I hate to use the word insidious, but it is almost insidious because you, with, with censorship, you know what happens. You know, you are not allowed to, you know, you cannot show a 10-mile radius of whatever. 
But where it's a request, we don't know who in government is making the request. We don't know why. We don't, uh, we don't know why they're making the request. Is it for national security reasons? Is it for some other reason? And we also don't know why, presumably, Google is complying. Is it to protect you know, business relationships, government relationships? It's the lack of transparency to this transaction that I, I find um, most disturbing. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of reasons. Uh, you brought this up yesterday when we were talking that Google would want to comply or be incentivized to comply. You know, uh, Anti like to be on the right side of the government so they don't get you know taken down for antitrust violations or anything like that. Yeah, you know, so large te technology companies, and this is true to of, you know whether it's Google, Facebook, any technology company, um, has relationships that they want to maintain with the government that go beyond um, a contract, uh, go well beyond a contract. Technology companies are dependent on the government for whether it's antitrust enforcement, for tax issues. You know, they touch the government in many, many ways every each and every day. Um, and you could look at it that it really caught. You know, it is very intimidating when someone from the Pentagon or DoD calls and says, you know, by posting this imagery, you are threatening the national security of the United States. Um, and I think from you know, a technology company side, it, it costs them nothing to comply. And you know, part of it is, is their own fear, perhaps legitimate, that if they don't comply, they will get in some sort of trouble or they will endanger the national security of the United States. And I think part of it is it, 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 you know, they benefit from keeping up friendly relations with government. So speaking of that, that guy who picks up the phone and you know yells at Google and tells them to you know <laughs> not update their imagery in a certain area. So throughout your career, you've spent a lot of time at places like Tonopa and are in this unique position to comment about the culture of these of these bases. So I guess what's what's the likelihood that any decision about Google Earth occurred because of like a specific attitude about secrecy at this space at Tonopa, uh, and not because of classified military testing in general, like? Could this be because of one neurotic commander at uh, Tonopa and not because of space drones? So this is what's so interesting on your project because it taught me something. So without the information you brought forward, I would guess, like if you came to me and said just speculate, I'd be like, oh yeah, there's probably lots and lots of bases where some paranoid military is like, my base is so important or this area is so important that you must shade it out. And so if without this information, if you just come to me, I'm like, oh yeah, there's probably dozens of you know military sites that are shaded. But that was what's so interesting about your project that no, it is this one specific area and that it's for a fairly extended period that if I had to guess that no, I mean, I think it was a very purposeful, I, I mean, again, here I am, it's just you know rampant speculation that it was a very specific request for spe very specific reasons. So do you know of anything that was going on during that time period, uh, you know, 2008 to, I guess, 2014, 2015, because recently Google had updated their, their historical imagery, but uh, the gap between 08 and uh, 2014 still exists. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, like, uh, if you've seen like sort of this uh, a shift in the type of technology the DoD is testing, right, and you can sort of speculate as to well, what they're what they're doing there now. So I can speculate, but but let me really caveat this yeah. by saying that I don't, you know, I, the technologies I can talk about, I don't know they were tested. Probably anyone who goes back and reads Aviation Week from that eight-year period or six-year period might come to better conclusions. Um, there have been, and there were reports in the trade, the aerospace trade publications, and particularly Aviation Week on the development of um, you know, dro penetrating drone aircraft. These are aircraft, um, one of them was the RQ-180 that I believe still isn't acknowledged, so it is still technically a black program that was de designed to go into what are called denied areas, areas like Iran, probably to take pictures of you know, nuclear test facilities or suspect, sorry, suspected nuclear test facilities. So again, I could guess that there were a lot of rumors and reports of new drone aircraft being developed in that area. Was this site used for that? I have absolutely no idea. Sure. So that, that is where I'm really getting into the area of speculation. But we do know from that period that there is um, there was a lot of development work now. There is now a new bomber that's being developed that 
is acknowledged to have come out of prior classified test programs, which I can informally speculate was from that time period. Again, was it this facility, this test site? I, I don't know. Sure, yeah. Uh, I guess to switch gears and kind of zoom out a little bit, I I'm actually curious to know about your view on the public's right to know about military technology. Like, do citizens actually have the right to know about what occurs at Tanopa? Uh, and generally, you know, what's your view on secrecy in this, in this regard? I'm a, I'm a journalist, so I'm a transparency right. <laughs> advocate. I mean, I, I understand, you know, why we have secrets. And I can acknowledge the role of people in the national security community whose profession is to keep those secrets. I am not in that community. I'm in a community where people come to me with legitimate information, classified or not, and I believe it has a public interest. I'll publish it. So, you know, I can see both sides of it. Um, yeah, so what do I think? I, I think that, unfortunately, too much is classified. Um, there is, especially after the end of the Cold War, I feel that a lot of classification of technology programs is done, not always, but at times, to protect the program itself from the American public, from the costs, from the schedule delays, rather than from some amorphous enemy. Not all of it. I mean, there are things that should be legitimately, perhaps, kept secret. That, that's not my problem. I mean, there, you know, we have an elected government, for better or for worse, and, you know, we, that elected government, you know, we have given it powers to keep things secret. I, I really, I am a transparency advocate, but I can understand why we have that. To me, the more problematic relationship is the one that we don't know about, um, you know, which is the one between government and technology companies and what things aren't governed by law, that the government can make requests that we don't know about, um, and that the technology company can comply with those requests for reasons that don't have to do with the law, but because of their own interests, and then that can shape the way we see the world. You know, laws can be good or bad, but if you know about them, you can change them. Classification can be wrong, it can be overreaching, but there's a way to understand it. When you have these relationships or communication where you have no way, you know, one of the things that we tried to do when you brought this up was file a Freedom of Information Act request. But I have to admit, it's a shot in the dark. I don't know what I'm requesting. I don't know, was it a phone call? Was it emails? Was it between Google? Was it between a base commander? Was it between the Pentagon? I don't even know. Um, and, and that's disturbing. That should be disturbing, I think, for, for the public. Right, and, and kind of going off of the same, uh, uh, the same kind of trajectory of talking about like the dangers of, of what we don't know between the government and uh, technology companies, but uh, there's a lot of soft power in how the government decides to fund uh, technology, right? And in your book, you talk a lot about, you know, there's, there's, real, uh, there's real implications to who decides to fund research and how that research is funded. Or, yeah. So could you talk a bit about uh, how that funding might define a technology to de uh, a technology's development? I think it defines sort of how we look at it. I mean, one of the most interesting things I find is in the United States, we tend to take it as a given that the military, that the national security establishment has been behind some of these technologies. So the you know, Earth imaging satellites came out of classified CIA programs from the original Corona program in the 1960s. And so on one hand, you can say that's marvelous. The intelligence community um, you know, gave us Earth imaging satellites that are now used for environmental reasons, are used for many wonderful reasons. But it creates a presumption, I think, in our society, whether you think that's good or bad, is, you know, it depends on your views, that a, in fact, that the national security community also has a right to sort of request redactions. And, you know, when I give talks in, in Europe, I'm always sort of shocked people ask about the ethics of national security um, community funding science. I'm like, wow, in the United States, it isn't even really asked about it. I think in Europe, they would take a completely different view. I think to a certain extent, because the military funded the basis of these technologies, we take it as a given that these companies might perhaps comply to protect national security. I, I can't say I know as well how Europeans view these issues, but my guess is because these developments don't come out of the military, they would take a very different view out of this form of self censorship so that's unfortunately all the time we have with Sharon. We could probably talk about this for, for another 30 minutes. But um, so if you could join me in you know, thanking Sharon Thank for you. being here. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Drew. Uh, we're going to move right on to the, uh, the next part of our, uh, our program. I'm going to call up Sebastian Gladstone and uh, Mark Bradford. Uh, if you guys just want to take a seat. Uh, Sebastian, on my left, for far left, <laughs> is uh, an LA-based artist uh, whose work has moved from digital collage to abstract watercolors and painting over the course of the last several years. Uh, his most recent gallery show was called, entitled uh, Pictures from My Dream at uh, Marvin Gardens in Richwood. Uh, Mark Bradford uh, runs his own firm, Mark Bradford PC, which specializes in copyright, trademark, arts, music, and media law, in addition to commercial litigation, uh, representing startups and entrepreneurs. Uh, he's on several boards and has done legal work for the Merce Cunningham Trust and Anthology Film Archives. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Sebastian a few questions, and I'm going to ask Mark a few questions, and then we're going to have a discussion uh, about copyright and art. Um, so Sebastian, um, so over the last four years, like I said, your work has moved from digital to physical collages to paintings and watercolors, which are primarily of abstracted landscapes. Uh, how does the work you've done on Tinopa with us fit into this, uh, the development of your process? Well, um, I guess one of the big things, you know, we, we talked for a long time before you guys could show me anything, you know? It was kind of like, almost like, Santa's coming at Christmas, you know? Like, or something like, you know, for, for months, you'd be like, we have these images, uh, we can't show them to you um, because we don't want to get sued, so we're trying to figure that out, you know? And we had a discussion for a long time and like, um, there was a, this concept of like good faith, basically. That was like, you know, if I was going to work with them, there was some good faith that I wasn't just trying to show them, show people the maps, basically. And then the context of my work is basically, um, you know, kind of deconstructing landscapes uh, as they relate to personal memories, experiences, etc. Uh, in a very, like, in a in a very um, non-contextual way to like some overarching idea that relates to everyone, you know, like personal experiences and uh, apolitical as well, you know, like I don't make work that's commenting on society or anything. And so in those ways, you know, acting in good faith to try and uh, really create like art objects out of the images, I guess that would kind of be how my process worked with what you guys were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And I think we had talked earlier about sort of like in contrast to someone like, uh, Trevor Paglin, who, who may have, who, I, I don't know him, but uh, who may be, have been more interested in a direct one-to-one uh, -one representation. Uh, and I, I wanted to sort of ask you about like the nature of your process for these four paintings and like how did you actually make them? Because it's interesting. So yeah, eventually Drew sent me the images um, and there's, there are basically different parts that you have to stitch together to create I don't know if you guys have a photo of that, but we, I basically, we stitch, you stitch together something and then I kind of mess with it in Photoshop. And um, I, I, we basically cr had a composition of all the images and then uh, I edited them in Photoshop to, for contrast and for color value and stuff like that. Uh, and then from there, went through the arduous process of trying to figure out how to represent them without like representing them too accurately um, or just, there was a lot, we had a lot of back and forth, you know? And one of the first things that I realized was, like, if I had to represent, if I had to paint a picture of you, for example, you know, like you have eyes and certain things that make up how you look, that it's like you're recognizable, you know, even if, the, even if it wasn't a 100% photorealistic version of yourself. But with a satellite image, like, you know, like, how do you show this somebody, like, aren't, isn't this great? Like, you, you know what this is, right? You know, like, it's kind of like there's no discerning markers uh, beyond a few lines and X's and circles of like what this actually is. Um, so there was really a struggle with not representing it photorealistically, but at the same time, you know, acting in good faith and trying to create a painting that is, you know, for all means like uh, human, I guess, and uh, a little bit expressive. Um, and so what I came up with was essentially like printing, printing the images uh, but first, I tried I tried painting them by my eye because uh, I've done I've done work like that for other artists where they'll just give me something to paint and I will essentially paint it uh, you know as realistically as possible. Uh, then we tried projecting it and still the, the the information is so exact 
that it, it was kind of like just, just blobs in the ether unless I wanted to spend, you know, an intense amount of time on each painting, which I, you know, I don't have like 60 hours, you know, for, I don't have the next four months to, you know, make these paintings essentially. So what we came up with was taking a lo-fi printing process called dye sublimation, uh, which is like basically how you make, like if your grandmother's ever sent you like a terrible blanket of your dog or something like that, you know, it's like that same process with like that, like a polyester material. Um, and it, what it did, there's a couple things that it did that I think helped us act in good faith. First off, it, it reduced the resolution of the image. Um, it changed the, the contrast of the image in a way that's not really up to us, you know, because this is like a lo-fi machine. And then um, beyond that, it mirrors, it mirrors the image around the bleed wrap of the canvas. So you can't actually necessarily see where the images end. Uh, and then I essentially painted on top of those in sections that I could discern, um, I could basically discern what they were, you know, because there's, there's large patches of the area that are just dense nothing, you know, even no matter how you adjust the contrast. Uh, and so that's essentially how we got to what you see. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the quote that you ended up um, saying to me, uh, Andrew, over the summer was that the paintings were going to be totally abstract and totally representational. Uh, which, which really interested me, but I, I think that it's not just a phrase that is actually sort of like what you were going for, right? Yeah, I mean, um, I didn't want to get sued, so, you know, <laughs> there's that. I've never been sued, but this, you know, I don't want to, the government is a scary thing, so I really <laughs> wanted to not mess this up and create something that was, you know, if you showed it to just like uh, someone walking by, they wouldn't be like, oh, tone of test range, or have you, how do you, is that how you say it? Tonopa, Tonopa test range, you know, they'd be like, Area 51, you know, I know where that is, that's a nuclear bomb, you know, going off right now. <laughs> so I was, you know, but at the same time, I really did, like as part, as part of the practice I was trying to create with this project, I wanted to try and represent these images in a way that you could experience them for what they were once you had information about them. Mm -hmm. um, and so at one point, uh, basically, if you look at it and you don't know what it is, it's, it's basically an abstract painting. And if you do know what it is, you're almost going to try and go underneath where I've touched the images to see the rest of the imagery. And you, you know, it, it can kind of create a, a map that was censored through my painting, basically, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that still serves as a map. You know, there's discernible areas of roads and, and markers where if you had a lay of the land, you could probably maybe get around, you mm -hmm. know. Okay, uh, cool. Well, thank you. I'm going to ask Mark a few questions, then we'll proceed. Uh, so for my first question to you, Mark, is sort of based on the event so far. Is this like a bad idea, what we're doing right now, or like a good idea? What do you think? <laughs> there are so many levels here. <laughs> in terms of the goodness and the badness of the idea, the goodness and the badness, uh, or the various concepts of, as you were saying earlier, good faith and uh, theoretically bad faith. Um, but whereas what I would say would normally be highly privileged and private, uh, it is the nature of this event to make it as public as possible. So anyone who's tuning into live stream has basically waived our privilege. <laughs> so I hope you're cool with that. Uh, I, should I be? That's the next question, isn't it? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> what, what, yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, is it, well the thing is, uh, you've had everybody sign, um, uh, well, so to speak, virtually. Uh, agreements or crack and, crack and sign agreements, more or less. What it would be is like if you break the plastic on your software, you've signed a contract with the developer mm -hmm. in, in some cases. It's just a sort of like, well, you walked in, you had a drink, you're a contractee. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it's challengeable, but I mean, there, it's to some extent kosher, bona fide, whatever. whatever well, they, you call everyone it. signed contracts I know. up front. Right. I know, that's great. Mm -hmm. uh, so I hope no one's looking at the live stream because they're exempt. Oh, okay. Well, we, uh, we, we blanked out the actual image That's on good. live stream. Good. So, but every, they should black me out too. I should, <laughs> I should talk in code, which I do anyway. I mean, if, if I'm not understandable, that's understandable. So the question, I mean, the, Brendan's initial question was, is this a good idea? Well, one of my favorite parables <clears throat> sort of, sort of is 
the difference between American culture and English culture in the early part of the 20th century, like, it's like Americans had an easier time with the question, what's your favorite color? You know, they just had, they, they had an answer. And English, in the early part of the 20th century, they would say, for what? A, a necktie, a flower? Um, so, good idea, for what? <laughs> for like, not being sued. Sued for what? <laughs> Anything. Okay. Well, the thing is, well, again, sort of getting back to my previous circumlocution, um, sued for what? You have a number of different issues in play, all of which you may be on the happy side of. That sounds good. So far. <laughs> but, I mean, basically, as if, if you've uh, looked at the exhibit in the other room, uh, you'll note the licensing contract that's laid out on the plywood on the far end of the room over uh, on, the, on the shelf over the drawings to the right of the wall where the paintings are hung. And as I, I think Drew was saying, was quoting, was actually quoting from it earlier with respect to uh, image derivatives. Um, if you had, were able to, to buy this image outright, and pass it on to Sebastian to make paintings from it. The paintings he made would not uh, involve copyright problems, any real discernible copyright problems. I mean, issues, am I losing my signal? I think the signal comes on and off, but OK. I got a landline. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's okay. Don't want to trip anybody. Least of all you. Thank you. Okay, I can just sort of lean forward, like I, like I mean it. Okay. Yes. I don't want to amplify that sound. All right. Okay. Um, if it was just a matter of copyright, you'd you certainly be, you know, almost categorically in the clear. Um, maps have been protected by copyright since 1790, believe it or not. Uh, but the whole premise of what's protectable under copyright law is what is original to the work in question. So the information on a map is not copyrightable. The organization, sometimes the way a map looks, the overall look and feel is the sort of term of art for it. That's often protectable. So if it's clear from whatever artwork is made from that map uh, that it's that, that is that specific thing that you copied, that's, that's implica it's implicated in the inquiry as to whether infringement has taken place. Uh, if it looks substantially different, that's the other, that's the other fork, that's the other tine in the fork, um, then in infringement is not in play. Uh, and those paintings, they look like land, ostensibly. Um, map, original maps, obviously of some kind provided the sort of, the, it's the referent for the figuration. I mean, it's, it's abstract, but it's basically, it's, that's kind of a blanket term, because it's, bas it's basically you are recreating figuration. I mean, it's not, it's not a picture of a house and a dog. It's, <laughs> it's but it's basically, it's gestural. I mean, it's gestural, it's a generating principle created by dry lake beds. That's fine. However, you have a contract saying you can't, you, you can't make, refer, make, you can't make uh, derivative images with that permission. So the question is, what's that for? Is that something that they would give you trouble about on the basis of Sebastian's paintings if you were to make them public, which they aren't now. They're, I mean, we're all friends here. It's all private. This is like uh, an inter-office memo. <laughs> I'm your lawyer, sort of. <laughs> uh, I'm paid in pizza. <laughs> it's good, you know. It's good pizza. Well, aren't they aren't they public though in the the article? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, the paintings aren't. The paintings still have not been disseminated. Uh, yeah, they have. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just I thought it was just one. Uh, two of the paintings were in the motherboard. Article. Oh, I've been. <laughs> and I'm. <laughs> you guys. 
Yeah, we, we also had attribution to Digital Globe and Sebastian you in the article. You are bad non-clients. <laughs> and I'm wondering if anyone has, if there's been any social media stuff of people posting them as well. It's academic at this point. Yeah, so. If, if, I know. mean, if, if we're in the soup, we're in the soup together. But uh, okay. I, guess, I guess one thing I, I would like to press back on is that you said, you know, they're obviously land. And I don't know, I mean. Well, no. Maybe, but, but going to what we were talking about of, you know, uh, good faith, essentially, sure. you know, you not knowing what you know now, oh, if sure. you looked at them, I don't necessarily know you would discern, like, oh, that's, this is a, this is a patch of land. Do you know what I mean? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with okay. that. And yeah. that's, that's actually more to the point. Yeah. But the thing is, they would look at it and say, oh, I know what that is. Yeah. That's our property. Uh, and we can show that you had access to that property and that this is, we think, substantially similar and an infringement, whereas a court or a jury might not agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, if they thought it was worth their while to give you trouble, or these guys trouble about it, that's a different issue entirely. There are people who own intellectual property, very sad to say, uh, with the money to give people trouble over it, whether their uh, claims are fully justified or would result in a verdict or not. That's just the name of the game. It protects people, but it all, it's also a cudgel. Uh, so, Mark, do you think that me continuing to ask you questions might be a bad idea? Oh, it's a horrible idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to broaden it up a little bit. But I think you have invited horror. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Drew, Drew I, and I tend to do I, that. I, I respect you for that. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's, it's not particularly hygienic from a legal standpoint, <laughs> but, um, well, biohazard, here we come. All right, good. Um, I, one thing that Sebastian mentioned earlier was good faith. And um, this was something that we genuinely were, and I think we're still trying to do, which is operate by the terms of the contract. And I was curious like, if you had any questions for Mark uh, about good faith or anything. You, you definitely told me about your processes trying to stay close to it. So I was wondering if you could like, ask Mark any questions about that, if you're interested. Yeah, so one question that when we actually spoke about this was the, the, the coloration and the contrast of the image. You know, essentially when, when Drew got the images, they were, they were just black, or data basically. And then when you put the data in Photoshop, for example, it would just be black, like a black square. And you would have to adjust the white balance to even see an image. Mm -hmm. um, and what they, had what they had said is that there's most likely some sort of program that you would, you would enter the data into and it would give you coordinates and um, a lot more info than you know, just dumping it into Photoshop and you know, having to mess with it to see anything. Um, and so I, one, one thing I was curious about is I'm guessing that the image that uh, you know, whoever would have access to these sort of programs would have uh, would be significantly different in contrast and color than to what the edited images I printed and painted on were. They would look, you know, considering what the Google image looks like, um, especially, you know, it's almost, the colors are almost inverted in a sense, and there's significantly less contrast. Like, do you think that legally there, there's anything to, to that argument? That um, what, what I did, what I, how I manipulated them digitally um, is already, you know, moving into uh, good faith territory, so to speak? Well, there's two, there are two answers to that. First one, in terms of a pure copyright standpoint, it's actually better in, in some respects because you're adding content to it. You're also interpreting it. Um, you know, you're almost critiquing it to some extent. However, from a, a national security or a disinclination to disseminate standpoint, which this company may have, I mean, the premium in the contract on, like, don't do anything that we don't like, maybe uh, their disinclination to have the information in the map or the images disseminated in any other way, uh, insofar as your interpretation uh, brings that information out. I mean, I'm talking, this is kind of theoretical, mm -hmm. but in case of, you know, as, as far as someone making an, a, an argument in theory, that's one they might make. Uh, if what you do uh, makes the information clearer, and, and to some extent what you're saying implies that, then that, would, that might be an issue. But this is, pr we're getting pretty abstract here. <laughs> okay, so maybe, th in, maybe. In the happy sense. Okay, maybe, okay, th then another question I would have is, sure. um, 
if I have a history of you know, my working process and the good faith reason of them bringing me into this is the history of my working process and the type of paintings I make, uh, which is basically the, you know, breaking down landscape, breaking down the context of landscapes into something that's uh, essentially like an abstracted uh, mm -hmm. image plane. Like, does, does that something that kind of uh, works towards me or it's kind of irrelevant? Well, I think, you're, I, I think it's all on them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you're going to be left holding the bag. Totally, yeah, but in the, in the legal sense, you know, I'm right. just curious for for these guys, you know. Right. Does that does that you know, uh, as opposed to going finding somebody who's maybe like specializes in working in art and technology who sure. identifies as like someone who works in the realm of information and, and privacy and stuff like that. Does that operate in good faith? You know, trying to find somebody with a practice like mine. I, I think as far as good faith is defined legally, I, I, I don't see any problem with uh, your position and what you did. Um, how public these paintings get in what context, uh, that's another issue. In terms of what you've done so far, I mean, they're lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up there. And one thing that w that I that I'm interested to find out later is whether or not we can sell Sebastian's paintings. But maybe we shouldn't have this discussion in public. No. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so uh, thanks. Thank you, uh, gents. And we're gonna keep moving. So that was terrifying. Um, so. I'm going to invite Marvin up to the stage. Uh, Marvin Mayfield is a poet and activist whose work is dedicated to ending mass incarceration. Uh, he's currently at Columbia University uh, pursuing a degree in social work. Uh, I've seen Marvin read his poetry here at, uh, Lives in Trans at the Lives in Transition event that we had uh, last February. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have, have that he agreed to take part and to share work with us and create work for this project. So. Before the scars, before the members of your heavenly body were dissected, separated one from another, you were there, spinning about in the universe, careless in the cosmos, placid and mild. Before the waters rose into the mist, leaving only a trace of your grandeur. Before the mighty mountain crumbled into dust, covering your nakedness, you were there, waiting. Willing nothing but that which is sure to come. Bringing your divine light into perfect view, then changing form. Who took you? Who? Oh. Fullness gone, and the earth abides still. Watching the children to which she lovingly gave life claw at the hem of her splendid gown. Bombed and beaten and torn by the spawn that cursed you to your face. You endured, endured endured patiently as only a mother could while your tormentors relentlessly ravaged you. Violet and black, scarlet and blue, the colors of your scorched veil. Wounded and bruised, open and defiled. The sacrificial virgin offered to a thoughtless crowd in thoughtless haste to satisfy nothing. Could your voice be heard? Would it say, me too? You desired not 
to give rise to the instruments of hate and destruction, for you had no lust for blood, yet you were consecrated to war. A lost child, I searched for you, as if you wandered off to discover some new thing in some new place. Even an insignificant coin desired and sought after is mourned at its loss. But only the heavens can gaze upon you now through metal eyes made with hands. For so evil were the deeds of men against you. They tried to hide you, to bury their sins in your forgotten sands. Where is my accuser, you say? Who can justify this wrong against me? Be not dismayed, mother. For what they built in honor of themselves will crumble. And the lies within their forged smiles shall be silenced. For nothing artificial ever lasts. And everything will once again return to the essence of you. So, Marvin, I'm going to actually uh, ask you some, a few questions about your process and stuff here. So, the, that was great. Uh, when we... When we first met right. uh, to talk about this project, you asked, on? Okay. You, you asked me how this land made me feel. Mm -hmm. And that was like an interesting moment to me, because uh, I'd been so in my head about censorship, national security, uh, Google and contracts and not getting sued, that like, I kind of forgot that this is real land with a stolen and violent past. Right. right? And, your, and your poem brings, kind of foregrounds that. Uh, so I actually wanted to turn the question to you, uh, and kind of ask you, you know, how did, how did the story of this land influence the poem, and what was your, your process? Um, well, when you first uh, uh, um, told me about it, Drew, I was uh, very interested about it. Number one, I'm a big fan of Google Earth, because I'm, I'm a geek in that, that, in that respect. Um, I remember being a child and looking at the cardboard globe that I would have in my bedroom and spin it all day and, and just wander and, and, and travel and think about, you know, faraway places. So uh, it, I was intrigued at the very beginning uh, that it was a process or uh, about uh, Google Earth. Um, also, um, I'm, I, I uh, believe in, uh, I believe that, uh, uh, that, uh, the FBI killed JFK. I believe that Jimmy Hoffa, Jimmy Hoffa is buried out in, in the 50-yard line in the Meadowlands, and, and I think Elvis is still alive. So I'm a conspiracy theorist. So, <laughs> so when I thought about the, the, uh, the government trying to hide or cover it up, and, and, and that this place, uh, this was a real, a real place in Earth that was being covered and being taken away from, from, uh, uh, from the people, from, from from the earth and being just uh, disregarded, I really wanted to uh, try and get in touch with that feeling. Um, as a writer, uh, you really want to try, a writer really wants to try to stay away from um, things that are cliche, that are passe. So I tried hard to uh, not um, use uh, typical terms of the desert because you think about the desert as something that is arid and dry and dead. And I wanted to bring uh, the story of that this was a real place that ha that had suffered trauma. That the Earth is alive. The Earth is what sustains us. So I tried to get in touch with with, with that emotion, that the that the Earth and that this piece of land has suffered. A piece of land that used to nurture, that now has been uh, uh, destroyed, and covered up. And and in your poem too, you talk about you sort of touch on this issue of consent, right? This land. As, 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 as this land had no agency. It was mm -hmm. stolen and blown up. Um, I, I'd be curious to talk about, or to hear about kind of how that, like uh, kind of that issue, right? The issue of, con of the lands being stolen and consent. Mm -hmm. Well, in, uh, in my experience, what I tried to do is to uh, relate the land being stolen to 
the uh, people being stolen. You know, like uh, the uh, the atrocities of, of slavery and how things have been, have uh, uh, morphed into a a uh, a thing where technology is is stealing and robbing and and denying us access to 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 the land that everyone should have had. Um, Granted, this place is in a desert, and, and maybe there's not many much traffic in this particular place, and they tried to, to make it obscure, but this was a land that was, that was uh, owned, well, not owned, but used, and, and, um, and, and, uh, and that, that sustained a people at one point in time. And so I only have time for really one more question, and something that- That's good. <laughs> Uh, you, you, a word that stuck with me, and also a word that you had said like the first time we talked was the word consecrated. Right. And I see, I see that it made an appearance in the poem. I, I'm, I'm curious right. about why that word, uh, why that kind mm -hmm. of struck a, struck a chord with you. Okay. Well, actually, I, I titled this, this poem, Consecrated. Uh, when you think of the word consecrated, it, it, it's usually used in terms of uh, something that has been uh, given... Uh, a, a divine right uh, and a divine that is related to a divine purpose. This this piece of land was consecrated, but not to anything to divine, but to something heinous, to something that was that would destroy, to something that was uh, devoted to the weapons of war, something that would uh, to shed blood and to uh, and and like I said, to uh, perpetuate the weapons of war and the weaponry. So I um. I gave it this title, consecrated, as as a uh, say uh, an antonym of what it really should be, of what consecration really is. Thanks, Marvin. Uh, okay. This has been great. It's been great having you. And uh, there, we've printed out some of the poems, and they're at the door on the way out. So feel free to grab one if you want to, you know, read it and get at Marvin if you want to talk to him more after this event. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that's kind of all we have planned. Uh, you know, we want to invite you guys to look at Sebastian's work and you know, ask us questions and just kind of be around the space. So you know, thank you to iBeam, Sally, Sarah, Jay, everyone really for, for helping put this together. It's, we couldn't have done it without you guys. So, and of course, thank you to the speakers, Sebastian, Sharon, Marvin, Mark. This has been really illuminating and uh, a lot of fun to do. Uh, yeah, we'd also like to thank, uh, real quick, uh, uh, Polyfill Foundation, which was able to give us the money to buy the image. And uh, Bill Cromie from Polyfill is here tonight. Uh, if you see him, hit him up, ask him about it. It's a cool idea. We'd also like to thank Rhizome, especially Michael Connor, who first had the idea for us to do an event. Uh, and Motherboard, which published the essay, especially uh, Jason over there. And yeah, we've already thanked the guests. Um, yeah, and we don't have time for a formal Q&A but we're gonna be around. You got any questions, please ask us. Yeah, and a final thank you to Roddy for you know, signing and paying everyone. That was, he, he didn't have to do that, and that was very, very nice of him, so that's, that's, that's great. So um, yeah, thank you all for coming, yeah. and we'll you know, talk to you later.